Welcome everyone to the Planet Microcap Showcase Virtual 2022. I'm your host, Robert Kraft, and I'm really excited to bring to you the Stock Pitch World Cup Team USA Pitch Session. USA! USA! Come on, Maj. And uh, <laughs> moderating Team USA Stock Pitches is a good friend of Planet Microcap, uh, someone who I always enjoy talking with for the Planet Microcap podcast. I love hearing his insights, as well as reading everything he's got going on at geoinvesting.com. Maj Sway Don. Maj, thank you for doing this, man. Hey, thanks, Bobby. Even though it is Team USA, I will say we're we have a very diverse group of people. We got, you know, myself. I'm, you know, I'm Lebanese and Spanish. I'm born in the US. We got uh, we got Jan from you know Europe. <laughs> we got uh, Jan Zvenda. We got Igor Ramnyak Ramnyak from uh, I don't know where he is. He's maybe he's Dubai these days. And then we got uh, Kim Abril from uh, Spain. So it's a pretty. It's definitely yeah. a world. It's, it's a World Cup within the within the within the U.S. <laughs> that, that's for sure. It's a, it, I, I was actually joking with Jason when we were recording the uh, Team Europe. I was like, "This is hilarious!" Like he has, I think he has three uh, North American investors talking about European stocks, and you got three uh, <laughs> non-U.S. Uh, <laughs> investors talking about uh, U.S. stocks. So you know, yeah. I, I'm all messed up right now in terms of. Uh, <laughs> it's okay, man. <laughs> there's always defection going on in, in the World Cup. There's there's, there's is, you know clearly <laughs> <laughs> so Maj real quick before we get into the pitches you know I, I mean look most people probably watching this are a little familiar maybe with uh, North American especially U.S. microcap environment and how it exists right now but why would you say now is the best time to be coming to events like this seeing stock pitches like this and really digging in and doing your research to uncover some of these companies that uh, may be completely overlooked or potentially oversold well I think it's simply because man it's, we're, we're definitely in that 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 beautiful saying, you know, buy when there's blood in the streets, right? I mean, it's 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 right now, and, and um, there is we're in a situation where everybody, I want to say everybody, but a lot of people have given up on in investing and throwing the towel, in, and they're just frustrated, and that means a lot of information just goes unnoticed, and that's especially true in the the nano cap space, small cap, micro cap space, where it's already a less hunted place anyway by people. So we have an opportunity now, as you know, playing taking advantage of that frustration and competing and looking for information already in a place that's not traveled well, you know, by investors to maybe getting, you know, multiple of that benefit now. So, you know, right now is just a great time to be reading conference call transcripts and SEC filings and press releases and seeing what investors are missing out there in some companies that have good stories out there still. Remember, there are companies that do well in a recession. I got started basically you know, um, investing in market turmoil at times or a recession when I was younger. So, um, knowing it, you know, when you do it at first, not knowing it's a recession, you don't care. You don't, you, you don't have fear when you have the money. <laughs> but now it's like, it's tougher you, as now as you, you have money to lose. It's, 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 it's not psychologically different, but you, there's going to be companies that are actually ben- going to benefit from recession. You know, one of our, one of our pitchers, um, uh, Kim has a pitch that's recession resistant, which is going to be great. It's going to benefit from recession. Um, some companies are recession, maybe not resistant, but maybe not going to be hurt as bad as other companies. Um, so, and there's, there's enough, we don't have to find 30 companies, you know, like I build a nice, maybe a five, 10 stock portfolio and there will be stocks that perform well. Um, and I think, you know, with there's 20,000 stocks in North America between the U S Canada, half of those are micro caps. There's plenty of opportunity in there. And I've been noticing that just a, a lot of information disconnect. Um, between uh, company stories and um, what's been go- what's going on in the market, uh, and I feel th- I think that you know, look, there's still a lot of excess out there, and a lot of stocks are going to go down. There's still over a thousand companies um, uh, selling over a dollar that are, are losing twenty, thirty. I think it was thirty million dollars a quarter. So it's it's pretty amazing. Or maybe it's twenty. I forgot what the number was, but it's, a, it's ridiculous, right? So that money has to come out. So we're going to see a lot of still, um, you know, stocks probably going to zero. Yeah, um, but we are we are truly, I believe, in, in a stock pickers market right now, and you, you're going to be rewarded for that. Finally, earnings matter, and you know, balance sheets, clean balance sheets matter. And I think instead of looking at the market, where is it going to go? Who cares? So I'm looking at where companies are going to go, and, and with each quarter that passes, we're going to get you know report cards on companies, and the investors are going to get more comfortable investing in companies and not care about the market. But it is a process to go through, and there will be a lot of volatility. So I'm, I'm pretty, you know. And, but you know, the thing is, you got to be right, though. If you are wrong, you're going to get slaughtered in this market too. <laughs> it's, I've seen some crazy, sure. um, 
drawbacks. But um, I'm having a lot of fun right now, basically buying on pullbacks. It's, you know, four times a year on earnings time, just getting your research, uh, you know, um, research um, vibe going and looking for companies getting crushed for no reason. And, and they're giving great news in their in their conference calls. Very good. All right. Well, Maj, you know, I think you had the perfect bridge. This is, you know, as you said, a stock pickers market. Let's get to some of those stock pickers. All right. So with that, Great. Maj, I'm excited to uh, introduce everybody to uh, Team USA. I'm excited too, man. Thanks, Bobby. So next up here, we have Kim Abril for Team USA, one of the investors I handpicked for our team here. So uh, I've known Kim for a little bit of time, for maybe three or four years, and I'm real excited to have him here to pitch his stock on our behalf. So Kim, take it away. Let's hear your pitch and then we'll, have, we'll uh, do your thing and then we'll have some questions at the end. Okay, thank you much. Thank you Robert, for this invitation for today. I have a short thesis in, so a small thesis in PaySign. Um, market cap today is 155 million. Current price is just below $3 per share. So let's see. Um, well, here's a disclaimer, just all of this is for just for edu educational. Right now, I'm not a shareholder of this position. Okay, go with the main idea. So PaySign is a prepaid car uh, company that they play in the plasma niche business. Right now, maybe at the end of this 2022, uh, PaySign is going to have uh, 462 plasma center agreements across the US. And, and is it growing more or less 50 a year? Plasma business right now is 90% of the revenue. All these thesis is related to the plasma business because uh, PaySign have two more business, the, the pharma and the, and the credit cards. But right now I'm just focusing on, on the plasma business, who is, uh, you can see here, it's 90% of the revenue. So the idea is like a macro call because as the US economy decelerates uh, and, I, and I'm expecting the economy in the US is going to enter recession next year, 2023, maybe in the first quarter, second quarter, in, in this scenario, U.S. citizens are going to come again to the plasma centers as usual before COVID to donate plasma and to win some extra money. And, uh, U.S. citizens can win uh, $600 a month just for doing two times a week to the plasma centers. This is the call of the, the main or the equity story of uh, this uh, thesis, right? Uh, so if you think that 20 to 23 is a recession year in the US uh, and you think a pay sign can recover the average monthly revenue per plasma center, who is one of the KPIs that I'm using for, for pitch this stock or to value this stock. And I think that uh, the average revenue per plasma center can reach uh, $9,000 a month. So this is uh, similar levels than before COVID. So if you think that U.S. economy can go to recession. I think um, pay sign could be a good uh, good value here. So what I'm doing is I'm forecasting a 15.5 million 2024 at Juice EBITDA. Uh, if you apply at 18 times EBITDA multiple, you can reach 5.15, dollars 5 uh, uh, per share, who is 80%, 85% up from current prices. This is the, 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 the brief, the abstract from the thesis. Let's go. What is plasma? So you know that 55% uh, of your, of the blood is it plasma, and then 92% uh, of the plasma is water. But here we are interested in this 7%. 7% of the plasma are proteins, where then uh, the companies like uh, pharma companies like Grifols, uh, CSL, Octopharma uh, make the medicaments to treat the PIDD and the CIDD. Right? This is the typical proteins that goes inside of the of the plasma then when uh, these companies extract the proteins they create the manufacturing uh, medicaments like isentra from csl this is the main uh, medicament main uh, for the us for soup uh, soup good in in immunoglobulins i think isentra is 85% uh, of the market share right now but grifols have the the other with shemi 5 who is a new product with higher margin so this is the protein uh, medicaments that the big pharma uh, doing when they extract plasma from, from people. So how pays makes money. So, uh, okay, the plasma donors go to the plasma centers. They, at the end, receive a physical exam. Then there are a plasma pharesis, which is the process to extract the plasma. 
and then they receive a commitment like uh, they receive right now eighty dollars per uh, per donation, and then can schedule for next time. So it's really easy to to extract money here. So a uh, pace is paid for each donor transaction, right? He, this is how uh, PaySign makes money. So what happens in the COVID and why this uh, PaySign could be an opportunity? So here is a, a slide from Grifols Investor Relation Day. And you can see here from uh, in when the COVID starts, the number of plasma collections for weekly, you don't have the numbers because Grifols don't disclose that. They go down dramatically. And they recover, but when the U.S. government government make checks to the U.S. citizens, they go down, and right now it's recovering. So, COVID was a really uh, disappointing and and drawdown problem for for uh, plasma business, and the the stock price was destroyed from here because at that time is when COVID quarantines start and government checks start. Remember that with the quarantine, people can go to the plasma centers. Plasma was open, but you cannot go there. So uh, the stock goes from $10 to $1.15. So uh, dramatically, the stock was destroyed. What's the opportunity then? How if you th if the US economy is going to enter recession, uh, you can follow lay index from, from conference board is a leading indicator. You can see here that right now it's here signaling recession. It's time that that uh, indicator goes here, uh, the economy goes recession, you can hear the gray area. So what's the opportunity? Um, US monetary and fiscal policies remain restrictive. Right now, there are no more checks for US citizens and the interest rates is go up and it's go up dramatically. You can see here the treasury yield curve. So it's from zero to 4%. So it's sure that US economy goes to recession. So in this macro environment, unemployment is going to increase. So I'm expecting that more U.S. citizens need extra money, like 600 a month, and they go to plasma centers. So uh, you can see, for example, in Central Texas, how uh, plasma donations are growing uh, a good growth, a good uh, tax rate, sorry, uh, revenue revenue rate, from 10 to 30 percent uh, growth rate. So uh, this is from for uh, for August from this year. So in many areas of the U.S. Plasma donations are growing. So uh, with that time from 19 to last quarter, uh, third quarter, uh, pace goes, is it increasing market share from 31% to 45%? Today is the plasma leader and has plans to reach 50%. They have an RFR agreement to add 20 more centers in 23. Uh, at the end, uh, do you know that the Mexican people can cross the board to to donor plasma, but uh, in September, the, the U.S. District Court uh, make an injunction to revert that. So plasma uh, pay sign can recover 20% of this revenue with this new uh, rule. Uh, funds loaded goes up, so 60%, 24% uh, uh, year, year, so year on year, 24% uh, quarter on quarter. So volumes are, uh, are increasing too much. And I think, uh, and I know that the third quarter was the highest revenue per month for plasma centers since COVID, and is it increasing? So here is my evaluation. So uh, I'm estimating uh, 564 agree plasma center agreements at the end of 24, with an average revenue per center, like in annual frequency of close to a little bit less than 100,000. I'm, ass I'm assuming a gross margin of 57% with GA expense as percentage of total revenue goes uh, coming from 48% to 35%. Here is my evaluation. So I'm expecting uh, a little bit less than 38 million, who is the guidance for the company for at the end of 22. And then I'm expecting uh, growing to, in terms of revenue, uh, 47 million and then 53.4. Uh, Where How I reach that? So I'm assuming a market share close to 45%. And then I'm assuming an average monthly revenue per plasma segment uh, center reaching 93,145. Uh, so this is, this is below than, uh, than uh, the numbers from COVID. So this is the two KPIs that I'm using for evaluation. One is the uh, plasma centers, the number of plasma centers, and the other one is the average revenue for that. So I'm expecting 15.5 million EBIT. If you apply uh, 18 times a bit the multiplier, I think it seems reasonable for this kind of business. You can reach across 
five uh, who is a good run up from uh, current prices if you want to use the lower uh, EBITDA multiple who is 11 so you can you can justify your actual price so i think this is a, an asymmetric uh, story right now that uh, is it going to play next year so i think uh, bobby this is my 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 10 minutes thesis in pay sign Hey, thanks, thanks, Kim. That was awesome and nice and concise. I do have I do have a few questions for you. Um, you know, we got about a few minutes left here to ask a few questions. I'm I, I'm, I'm familiar with the company somewhat. Um, there was a, a time when this, this stock didn't you know let's say even before COVID, it had a nice little run from under a dollar to hit twenty bucks. I don't recall what the valuation was back then when it did that run, but um, can you maybe talk about uh, that run to 20 and what I think some things sort of breaking down before COVID, right? A little bit, Can you maybe talk about what happened there. Cause yeah. it came along back down to 10 bucks and I'm eventually down to one, as you know, so. Yeah. Here uh, before the run up. So one uh, US investor discovered the company to the community and then the company goes really up. So they'll play really well, but here there are different things. Um, the first one is okay. People start to sell because the run up was really high. Then the company reclassifies some revenue from pharma business because they are maybe too much aggressive uh, accounting for that. But uh, I think it's well, something that the people know. And uh, I know I talked with a company about that. So right now, uh, pharma revenue goes from 7 million to right now less than 1 million. So I'm not computing pharma revenue in my numbers. And the real problem is when COVID starts, right? Because... Um, this is a business that needs that people go to the plasma centers, but with the quarantines, uh, the governments don't allow the people to go out to the streets. So the plasma center was open, but anyone is going to the COVID. And this is the because from here, which, uh, when quarantines start, uh, the stock goes down to that number. And then also people helps the, uh, sorry, government helps the people in the US with checks, two checks from, I think, uh, 2000. Uh, one check and the other one is one half uh, 500. So if you receive money, you don't need to go to the plasma center to receive uh, 600 a month. But right now the checks stop um, and right now you don't have quarantines. And as the economy is enter recession, people in the US maybe need extra money. But the, the explanation for this drawdown is, uh, is COVID, is quarantines, is government checks, and is there a classification from from the pharma business? And just, and just thanks, thanks, Kim. And just to be clear, I I also am not a current shareholder of this of the stock right now. Um, so um, you say I see I see you gave some targets. Did you consider that um, what the, the capital needs might be for the company um, going up to twenty four? Do you think they'll have to raise money, or do you think they could do everything now organically moving forward? Yeah, I think I'm just that, that would affect your valuation, right? A little bit if that was the case. Yeah, my valuation is just is for 2024. So uh, and it's, it's only for the plasma plasma business. Remember that this is a, a duopoly because there are two companies that that has this business. So this is a 100 million revenue business. Uh, PaySign right now is the leader. Uh, remember that in 2011, uh, Citigroup was the leader. Then they sell the the business to other company, and PaySign uh, starts to this business in 2011. Um. Remember that Worker was the main competitor of PaySign, but Worker makes a uh, bankruptcy uh, last year. So today, uh, a private equity bought the assets from uh, uh, from Worker, and right now uh, there are only two competitors. Uh, big companies that they don't want to to enter here because this is a niche market with less than 100, 150 million revenue, so they are not interested because the competitive um, uh, environment is really good. So I think uh, I think. The market structure is good, and the macro outlook is pitching that this stock should to go up because uh, in every recession, U.S. Americans go to plasma centers to to win extra money. And 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 again, you don't think they'll have to raise money in the next two years to execute their goals? I don't think so. Okay. Now, uh, real quick before before we wrap it up here, there are other. So this is 90% of their business, I think you said, right? The plasma side of the business is at 90% of the business. But they also talk about um, in, their, in their filings about other parts, like the corporate rewards program and serving the unbanked. Um, 
you know, through prepaid cards. So I'm assuming corporations could load load um, money on these prepaid cards instead of sending you know sending out a check, or whatever. Uh, reward programs. Now that's have they done anything with this business? Is it, is it growing, or did they care about much? And did they have any? Is that a potential optionality in the story? Should we should we bake that into growth at all? Uh, could be a potential uh, optionality, but I'm not computed that because before uh, that company enters the plasma business, they enter the pharma business with copay, right? So they never should the, the they never can scale this business. So I'm not too much confident with these two, two other business, but I don't need that because the stock was trading at one dollar, right? So right now it's bit below three, and plasma business you can value a range from five to six dollars. So I, I don't need the other business. Right? Okay, and one last question, Quinn, before we wrap it up here. In yeah. terms of the amount of um, people who actually go to plasma centers, right? Um, are we at um? Where, what would the historical peak be? What would what would the, what would be the maximum number of people you would see? Maybe, uh, you know, um, do we have that number anywhere? That does that stat anywhere? El, well, my number is first to recover the 2019 numbers before the COVID. Okay, remember that in 2019 we don't have a recession, so. What I think is that in, in a recession, numbers could be higher. So uh, in a in a bull case, uh, you can expect numbers in terms of average revenue per plasma center could be higher than than the numbers from uh, 2019, who is um, more than 100,000. So I know this company because I'm from Spain. I'm located in Barcelona and Griffles, who is one of the main players in, in the plasma business in the US, is from here. So I, I used to talk with the management of, of Griffles and they start to recover the, the plasma volume. So um, a recession is the best thing, is the best uh, the best catalyst for this company. So this is because I think it would be interesting for 2023. Okay, great. And and um, well, thanks, Kim. This has been awesome. We're, we're out of time. I, we, I'd love to talk to you more about the company, but we could do that some other time. And hopefully uh, this is uh, one of our uh, top performers in, in, in the competition. Appreciate your time. We'll be talking soon. Okay. Thank you for inviting me, Mas. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. So now we uh, with, we need to thank Kim for his presentation on, on Pays, P-A-Y-S. Now next up for Team USA is Jan Zvenda. Um, uh, Kim came from over, uh, was a, a Spanish member of the Team USA. <laughs> and now we have a European member in Jan. He's, he also works uh, aside me as my analyst in my, in my companies. So um, he's here to present PXHI. I own the stock. I'm um, going to just disclose it up front right now. Um, so Jan, take it away, man. Thanks, Mash, and thanks, Bobby, for 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 having us. Um, uh, I would also disclose that I'm I'm long uh, Phonex, uh, and I'm going to be talking about today why I feel that uh, the stock has a really good potential in the in the next year or so. Um, the usual disclaimer now, right into the company description. So basically, what Phonex does is that they have this. A we sell cellular business, uh, which is basically a business uh, focused on secondhand phones. So they source secondhand phones and then they sell it. Uh, pretty straightforward and easy business. Uh, really nothing much more to it. Uh, they've been trying to do it B2C uh, initially, but now they're just doing it B2B. Basically, they source, you know, hundreds and hundreds of iPhones and Androids and Samsungs uh, and help businesses that, you know, need that quantity, quantity of phones. Um, and um, they have this kind of platform and they've been also trying to develop a software that they, they can sell to some other uh, uh, providers of such of such services. Uh, really, really straightforward business, you know, nothing much more to it. You can think of it as kind of this liquidation services, you know, where basically you have, a, a, you know, a hundred laptops from company that might not need them anymore. And basically someone's looking for 10 or 20. So they kind of split it up. So that's kind of the basic, uh, basic thing here. Uh, it might really seem simple, but it has staying power. I mean, it, you know, especially in the days of supply chain restrictions and so on and so forth. I mean, uh, a lot of people need uh, need access uh, to to inventory, and and you know that's been really um, uh, something that uh, has been beneficial for for Phonex uh, itself because they've seen really strong uh, strong trading, strong uh, growth uh, of revenue and 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 gross profits as well. Um, so there is that supply chain side which helps the whole. Uh, whole thing. 
Uh, and we've also seen, of course, uh, a, a strong trade-ins, which are very important for the stock uh, itself, for the business. So basically, you know, for iPhones to be, you know, traded in, that's very, very important for the business that's been happening. Um, and there are, there might be some industry trends that, you know, might uh, eventually, um, uh, you know, commoditize the business a bit or, you know, make it a, a bit less exciting from the, from the growth perspective. But right now we're not seeing that. And in any case, you know, the, the bottom line is that it's such a simple business that it has great staying power and, you know, people, start to rely on diesel cellular a lot so therefore i don't i'm not afraid that you know it would be really um a victim uh of of a quick success you know uh, uh whereby the others start to eat into the market share and so on and so forth so that's that's kind of important to note about the 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 business description itself um and uh, then basically what is what is interesting why we're highlighting it right now is that the stock hasn't been moving uh, much in the past nine months, almost a year, while their numbers are just on fire. Um, you know, they are really uh, growing, uh, growing sales. They have about 101 million in nine months. Uh, you know, the, the thing is, of course, that the gross margin here is pretty, pretty low. So, uh, you know, the gross profit ends up being only uh, 11 million. Uh, but when you look at the, the growth numbers, uh, you know, sales are increasing, gross profits are increasing slightly more, which is even even better. So you're looking at a company that that is able to uh, grow, but they've been they've been able to grow at scale, and they 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 run a pretty lean uh, organization. You know their cost cost structure is very simple. They don't need any any fancy uh, salespeople and so on and so forth. They don't need really a complex structure to make it work. They already have a very uh, uh, well run uh, uh, machine, and so yeah, so they're they're actually able to get some some scale, some benefits of scale, uh, and then then they are able to 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 be profitable, uh, uh, you know, by uh, by uh, by a lot. The net income is about you know four point six million nine months. We can assume you know six million for the whole year, which is going to be important when looking at the the market cap. What is also uh, what is also interesting, and I'm, I'm just gonna see, uh, you know, just for you to understand the the, the, the valuation since I since I talked briefly about it, uh, you know, with the current uh, with the current uh, share price, which is about dollar twenty now today, um, but uh, you know, it, it is uh, resulting in in really really uh, attractive numbers. PE is just about six, uh, you know, EBITDA. Uh, uh, is six million in the past nine months, and if I if I assume seven million a bit, that which is very conservative because they've been able to grow almost each quarter, and you know there's nothing that would mm, uh, show uh, that they should slow this growth down. You know, uh, EV a bit a bit is about four times. Uh, you know, that's really that's really uh, assuming the seven million a bit debt for the whole year, which is conservative. So you're looking at, you know, the, in the valuation perspective, you can you can kind of look around the the stock uh, from 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 all sides and and kind of come up to the conclusion that it's uh, that it's very cheap. Uh, also, you know, they don't have as much tangible book or they don't have much assets, let's say, apart from cash, because, of course, they're they're turning out a lot of cash, but they have no debt. Now, which is really important to say. So even though the evaluations that I've looked at here are mostly profit driven, you know, the balance sheet is, is, is very solid as well. And they've been they've been trying to really make sure that they don't have uh, any sort of financing risk um, and they don't need to raise any money. They just basically keep on running the business as is. Um, the, the other part. Um, so you have you have a pretty straightforward business uh, that is, you know, really uh, well operated. Um, you know, growing each quarter, um, you know, without too many issues. Um, you also have a very, very aggressive management team, which is trying to basically repurchase as much shares as possible, uh, which is, of course, a double edged sword here. But we believe that, you know, it does show the confidence in, uh, of the management team in the company. Um, the insiders that are kind of noted in the filings own roughly about 74% of the stock, which makes it relatively illiquid but there are you know there is a uh, volume out there on a daily basis it's not that it wouldn't trade you know every day or so and th there is about you know a couple of grand each day at least um and some days you know on the earnings it can it can go uh quite um up quite well 
Um, so they they uh, so they own a lot. So th- I think they they are very aligned with the success of the whole operation, uh, and they want even to own more. Uh, you know, they they bought back about eight point two million shares in the past two years. The company had had about forty million shares, so it's really a significant number. You know, if you if you look at the if you look at the the trades that they've done, you know, they've really buy, bought back about seven million. Uh, 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 you know, worth of the stock, which is really, which is really, uh, insane for a company that is roughly, uh, valued at 40, 40 million, uh, bucks. So that's really, that's really great, uh, for, for us shareholders, because of course we're going to get, you know, more, more piece of the pie, a uh, bigger piece of the pie in that sense. Um, and, uh, they seem to really continue to do that quite a bit. So they've been using that cash flow, uh, to 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 repurchase shares and you know we're not talking about Amazon here who, who you know they can announce a 10 billion uh stock buyback and you're not you know you're looking at it maybe one percent of the company or whatever it is here you're looking at you know 20 30 percent of the company being bought back which is really which is really aggressive and re- really positive for of course for for the valuation for the valuation itself so the management team I think believes believes in the story uh, they had a um they had basically uh, they had basically uh, ability to uh, a part of the insiders had ability to to um, uh, convert their preferred share. So there was there was some debt uh, that they incurred in the past, and the insiders had the option to either uh, get paid in cash or co- uh, convert it into shares. All of them converted into shares. So again, it's just showing that. The insiders uh, are really um, feeling that the growth can continue in this way, and they want to uh, they want to own a lot of that, a lot of the company. Um, also, you know, like quite a few things point out to a possible buyout. Um, uh, really, they they discontinued their credit line, which is you know fair enough. Like you you're running such a smooth operation in terms of the cash flow that you don't really need it, which is great. So the working capital is really not an issue for them. Because of the cash that they have on their balance sheet, um, but um, uh, you know, th- th- you don't you don't usually do that. Um, I think that what they've done it for is really they've been trying to in be you know explore strategic alternatives. Uh, you know, the the proxy um, uh, in 2020 also co- talked about a cash bonus in case of sale for. The management team, which is really, uh, which is really important, uh, and showcases that basically, you know, it's really going to be, uh, going to be, uh, something that they want to look forward to. Um, and they, they haven't done it yet, but we believe, you know, that they're looking for it. Uh, and especially the buybacks are really, are really something that, um, you know, mention or, or kind of like showcase that they're interested in doing so. There is the double-edged sword. It could be that the management is going to try to lowball the stock, but we believe that they will still offer a premium. And you know, if you're looking at the at, at the valuation again, you know, you're looking at at, at a stock that is at, that is very cheaply valued. That even if they are trying to somehow lowball it, they will still have to put up a, a nice premium. You can see that the stock was 170 at some point, so uh, we're not really super afraid about getting uh, getting something that would be completely unreasonable. So yeah, I think that's that summarizes it. You have a simple business that is growing, uh, is well run. Management is super aggressive, super bullish, and you have a valuation that you know uh, creates a margin of safety. That's how I would summarize it. Hey, thank you, Jan. That was a nice, concise uh, summary there, and I, I know the story well because I've owned it for some time, like myself, also. Um, uh, when I when I first bought the stock, it wasn't uh, quite as clean yet. I think it was trading around thirty or forty cents or so. Now, um, interestingly, the, you talked about some of the buyback, um, the trends, but the last buyback, I think, was actually about a buck twenty or so, which is which hopefully will set a new low for the stock. Um, and I remember, uh, I think it was in two thousand twenty or one, maybe the CEO or the CEO put out a, a press or they put, put out a press release, and the CEO basically is saying in the press release, the public press release, if you want to sell your stock, call me up and I'll buy it from you. So, uh, and the stock was, you know, in the dollar range there. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, one thing on the gross margins, I guess that's where I think a lot of, we look at the valuation of stock and what's the hidden risk here. And I think it's the gross margin area is where um, people might look at that and maybe not want to give it a high valuation, but um, they've come up a little, the gross margin have been increasing a little bit. And I think as a position from the brick and mortar, just buying their old business, just buying phones, inventory and selling them. 
to this more software platform of allowing other companies that want to do what they do on, in a, in, on, on a platform. I guess you want to, they, they call it SaaS, a software platform in the final, but I'm not quite convinced yet it's SaaS. We don't know all the, the how they generate the income from that totally because some of that income is, gener- uh, is, is derived from the, I guess, the transaction, right? But um, yeah. I guess um, that's, I guess, my biggest concern is, well, can they get gross margins a little higher as they convert? Can they get enough revenue from the software platform to, to offset, you know, to, to, to make it more of a piece of the revenue? And they, they talk about it growing, but they really don't talk about the size of that business. They don't break it out. So we, ha- we have no idea, right, um, what's going on there. And um, so, yeah, that's cool, man. And I think the other risk too, Jan, and I remember we talked about before is um, if you go into situations where there's a delay in a release of an iPhone, that delays trade-ins, right? So that might delay the ability to get inventory to to, to sell used phones and stuff. But um, and that was a lot. And in the, their past history, that was some of their problems in the past. This guy, these guys have a real crazy history, <laughs> um, and that were some of the issues. But um, yeah, so I think that what do you see? Like, um, I guess your biggest concern was going private transaction, right? And yeah, that, that, I guess I, mean, I guess so. But that, that, yeah, it's yeah. a good good concern to have. It's a good concern to have. I think that the business concerns are definitely there. I believe that. You know, what the management is trying to do is probably really trying to get to that 90% or trying to really sell the business, uh, maybe even before the industry trends change, um, you know, um, so to speak. Um, so you, you definitely, there are, there are concerns here about, about some of the, some of the operations. How can they run it? But, um, but it's been, it's been for two years, you know, it's been for two years, they've been able to, you know, maintain this growth and really ramp up the numbers. So it's really, we're not talking about, you know, quality, volatility and quarterly releases anymore. You know, in the past, they've been struggling because of like B2C and then B2B, they, they changed the business a couple of times and they, they really found footing now. So um, it's, it's almost like, yeah, you can definitely have concerns, but you know, at quarter after quarter, they just showcase the same thing. So it's a bit harder to, 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 to do that, but still over the long term, like five plus years, for sure. There are questions there. Yeah. And the cool thing is there's no, there's no risk of an offering or a kind of, you know, yeah. uh, that lotion because they're buying next that they clean their balance sheet up. So you have a situation where the company is definitely the risk itself, right. To some degree. Um, yeah. And maybe if you know if we continue to see more margins or they become more transparent, what's going on, we can get up more uh, re rate and evaluation to the upside. So I think sure. it's a solid pick, Jan. You know, so I'm happy that you, you did this a good job. And um, maybe, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm not sure, but. but <laughs> I would say, I would say, I would say that, you know, like it's, it's, it's really like in my, you know, past five years looking at the OTC stocks, you know, day in, day out. I mean, this is a classic case of like someone, you know, a business that is just, uh, you know, real, well run has some management incentives in the right way and you know therefore you're you're just like looking at that and people don't really know about it they might not look you know they might not be aware of it and it's just gonna be you know like this maybe for next year or so but then suddenly something happens and you know it doubles hopefully i I wouldn't rule out an uplist you know that that as as a i think i think the catalyst i think it's either an uplist if they want to stay public or they good they they they, they sell the company Sure. Um, is what I guess we're looking at too here. So maybe a double, hopefully at the minimum, and see what goes on from there. Sure. All right, thanks, Sean. That's been awesome. We have, we've been here with Jan Zavenda for Team USA, coming up to us from Europe with a pitch on PXHI. So thanks, Jan. Thanks. Good. Thanks, bye. Wishing you luck. <laughs> Hello, this is Maj again. We're here with Scott Weiss. Scott's uh, rounding out our Team USA um, team over here to hopefully uh, give us some good pitches here for everybody. So Scott, nice seeing you here again today, man. Thanks. Thank you. Good to see you. Thanks for doing this, and thanks for being a member of Geo for a few years. Um, and I'm really excited to hear this pitch you got going on here. Because that's why we just um, start with you giving that pitch, and then I'll have some questions. Um, you know, in the end, sure. Um, sure. As, 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 as to wrap it all up, and I think this is a pretty interesting idea you got going on over here. This is Scott Weiss from Semco Capital. I'm based in Chicago, and I manage microcap money that is focused on companies that are going through some kind of a change or transformation, Um, trying to find companies that have transformed their business or uh, driven by a new management team, a new product, something along those lines. And I have found a pretty good one in a company called Assertio Holdings. The symbol is A-S-R-T. And I got involved in this initially at the end of last summer. Um, watching a presentation with a guy by the name of Dan Pizer, who is the CEO. And it turns out that I knew Dan 10 years, 15 years ago, 
as we worked together on Wall Street. He was at a healthcare hedge fund and I was at an investment bank. And Dan and I had been friendly and um, I reconnected with him. He went to industry and in the spec pharma space and ultimately landed as head of business development at DepoMed and then became their CFO. Meanwhile, in the uh, 2015 to 18 to 20 timeframe, uh, DepoMed became a Certio and they had gone through two managements. Um, at the end of the second management team, uh, which had just gotten fired by the board, they asked Dan to step up and be the CEO. This was in the beginning of 2021. So January of 21, the company was bloated. They had a legacy product line with limited patents and durable, durable assets. Dan stood up, recognizing that he had an opportunity to transform the company. He immediately stepped in, cut the sales force to zero and focused marketing on internet sales, um, realizing that the traditional pharmaceutical model of hiring uh, young 20-somethings to bring lunches in the dock offices was a thing of the past. They have three legacy products that are small, that aren't really even worth talking about. They've got one asset that is a significant driver. It's called Indocin. And Indocin is essentially an insurance product. Hospital pays $750 to it's an or it's a suppository given to patients to prevent pancreatitis that are going through a particular kind of surgery. When Assertio, the company did about 40 million in revenues in Indocin in 2020. Um, 2021, uh, Dan's first year at the helm, they did about 60 million in revenues. This year they're gonna do about 85 to 90 million in revenues. And there's a path to make this a $250 million drug. So the story was to transform the company away from low growth, um, no patent protected products and acquire products that had uh, patents and that had durability. And Indocin was such a cash cow, they had a pretty good balance sheet. So at this time today, They've got $65 million in cash and about $69 million in debt. Um, and they've got this drug, Indocin, which is driving the business. And in the last 12 months, they've done two acquisitions. They've acquired two products. One's called Atrexup, which is about a $15 million a year product. It will grow mid-single digits and maybe more over the next couple of years. It's an injectable methotrexate. And they just acquired a couple of weeks ago another drug called Symposin, which is an orphan drug to treat a rare form of epilepsy in children. It's on a run rate to do between 10 and 11 million and has the potential to double or triple over the next couple of years. So let me back up a second. When Dan took over as CEO in January of 21, the stock was trading at around 85 cents. He cleaned up the business and started cutting costs and started driving Indocin. And ultimately in 2021, his first year, they did 111 million in revenues and they did EBITDA of a near 50 million. And the stock was trading, as I said, near a dollar. So obviously it was extremely inexpensive. Um, he had raised guidance the second half of 21, both quarters. Coming into 2022, he had made the uh, promise that he would acquire 50 million in product sales within a two year span. He's acquired 20 million of that goal. So they have 30 million more to go. At the time that he took over, the balance sheet was stretched in that they had 70 million in debt that was held by vulture uh, hedge funds. As we got into the summertime, the stock had started to work. The stock had gone from less than a dollar to around the $4 level. And then he, um, there were some issues around the debt and there was some concerns about it getting called in 2023. So they reported a terrific Q2 where they beat numbers, they guided higher. And a couple of weeks after that, they filed a convert. The convert was to pay off the existing debt 
give them a little bit extra cash for acquisition purposes and extend uh, the debt terms to more favorable, uh, more favorable to the company. And so street didn't like this the stock went from four to a low of around $2 and 10 cents and sat there over the course of the last few months. In hindsight, this saved the company. If they had called the debt in 2023, it would have it would have gobbled up all of the company's cash and prevented them from doing any additional acquisitions. So by extending the debt five years out and cutting the interest rate from 13% to 6%, they're saving a very substantial amount of interest annually. So let's focus on Indicent. Indicent is... 70 ish percent of revenues, maybe even more of profits. It's been on the market for 40 years. It does not have a patent. It does not have any competition. And this is part of the reason the stock is trading at 1.7 times EV to EBITDA and five times earnings. And uh, early at the end of the Q3, the company announced that they're going to be starting studies in the spring of 23, with the goal of getting a three-year exclusivity on Indicent. So the generic competition, while it's a concern among investors, it's less of a concern with management as this is a drug that is has proven to be very difficult to manufacture, virtually impossible. There's one manufacturer in the country, company based in North Carolina. Assertio has got an exclusive, exclusive license with them, completely locked up all of their capacity. So there hasn't been any competition and there's no competition on the horizon. Certainly this is a black swan type event, but it hasn't happened yet. And there isn't anyone on the horizon that is looking to compete um, with this drug. So right now it's folk. It is, um, it is sold specifically into the high risk segment of the marketplace that it uh, competes in. And that is about a $150 million market or so. And they have a monopoly on this market and it's growing low to mid single digits. The, the, the opportunity is to move this into the moderate segment of the market, which triples the market size. And with these studies that they're doing in the spring, it'll give them two things. It will give them exclusivity for three years and it'll enable them to promote the drug in the moderate side of the market, which theoretically, if successful, could take the drug from roughly a hundred million dollar market today or, or revenue today to two to three hundred million over the next three to four years. And if they can successfully transform the company into one with patents, with durable assets, then the valuation should be able to expand immediately and significantly which is why I think the stock goes from three today to $10 or so over the next two years. I'll leave it at that and happy to answer any questions, Maj. Hey, thanks. That was, that was an awesome summary. Uh, oh, we should, I mean, should disclose that you own, you own the stock, correct? I do own the stock. It's my largest position and I've owned it since uh, last summer. Okay. I, I own the stock, also, uh, some of the stock also. And I, I will say that you've been pretty um, you know, pounding the table on this uh, stock for some time with, uh, with, with conviction, even if, when you've met some criticism here, too, which has been great for me. I, you, you and I have gone back and forth on this, right? And, um, and so I think, I think the story definitely um, sounds interesting now. Some, it's been, it's been de 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 a little bit. The question I have for you, you mentioned something about um, I, I, Edison um, and that it was, it's hard to manufacture. Um, by by competitors, I, you, I mean, maybe if you could maybe get into that a little bit. So, and then and then the patent protection you're looking to get is that only in the the lower tier, the lower risk areas, or is that the, across the whole spectrum it, of the market? It would be on the drug itself. The drug, on okay. Yeah. Okay. So they would have three years exclusivity on in any indication, whether it be high risk or moderate risk. Um, as for the manufacturing process. I can't tell you why it's so difficult to manufacture. Um, I'm not sure the management team can either. Uh, the CEO has told me in the past on multiple occasions that when he was at Marathon Pharma 12 years ago, they had looked at buying Indocent and they passed on it for this very reason. 
And then they looked at it again in like the 2012, 2013 timeframe. Um, and they passed on it again and for the same reason. And they could never really get comfortable with the, um, the lack of patents and the black swan that a someone like a Teva or a Watson files and competes and comes into the marketplace. Okay. So he ends up going to Depomed and now a Sergio. And um, obviously he is more comfortable now that um, it is, it doesn't have patents as he's, his knowledge of this, of this drug has been the last 12 years or so. Of course, the drug goes back 40 years. And they've never had a competitor in this marketplace. Okay. So um, I think that the risk is that is, there is a risk. Uh, and it's hard to quantify what the risk is. And with all companies, there's a black swan event. And this is it for a certain. Yeah, but it's possible that because it's, it may be hard to manufacture that it might not be um, as a black swan as you might you think, right? Exactly. And that's that's the case I'm trying to make. Right. And, but, the patent, and, but the patent only helps it, I guess, in the end. Well, so when we first started talking about this last summer, you know, there wasn't any discussion about getting exclusivity. Well, now we are literally three months. Away. They've already filed their pre-IND. So we're now three months away from them starting studies to, to get exclusivity. So the conversation over the next six to 12 months is going to shift towards uh, exclusivity, towards patent protection. Mm -hmm. And of course, that will immediately change the multiple and the valuation on the company. Okay. So what do you think? So, you know, obviously it, it seems like investors maybe are looking at that. Maybe, maybe they're placing two. We don't know. We don't know why the stock is trading at a discount per se, but we can say, Hey, that's one thing maybe that's causing it to be at a discount. Right. Yep. Um, I guess the balance sheet was another thing, right. That they now, you know, they de-risk that a little bit. Yeah. I think that the dilution as part of the convert, um, really spooked investors obviously investors don't like dilution especially in microcap and they don't like converts and i think that and, and the management team they had always said moving through the first half of this year that their goal was to refinance this high interest debt mm -hmm. at some point and in conjunction with a product acquisition mm -hmm. well what they were finding as they were moving through 22 was there weren't they were struggling to find not find deals, but struggling to get deals done. Mm -hmm. And the timing was starting to get tight. And so as we got into the second half of this year, um, in early 23, without any kind of a, of an up of a deal. And, um, th they were bumping up against their covenants mm -hmm. and they feared that as they exited this year, that debt could be called. And it, the, the debt expired in the second half of 23 Mm -hmm. And January 1 of 23, the debt could be called at any time. Okay, I see. Okay, So they had the money to pay it off, but it would have really crunched the balance sheet and prevented them from doing uh, any M&A type of activity. Mm -hmm. And that would have basically put a cap on the valuation mm -hmm. and killed the company. Okay, so that. by ripping off the Band-Aid and taking this one-time hit, Arguably, he saved the company. So and frankly, he extended the debt terms by five years and cut the interest rate from thirteen percent to six percent. Okay, so and, and so it's still cheap with that with the dilution. You're, you're factoring that into your valuation, somebody. So with, you know, you're, you're still, the stock is still inexpensive based on the yeah. potential dilution, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, and by the way, I want to stress they got seventy. They have sixty-five million in cash sitting on their books. They're, they generate about twenty million a quarter in in free cash, okay. roughly. It depends on the quarter. They they are they're hoarding cash. Okay, mm -hmm. this may in the end not be dilutive. They're going to pay this off at some point over the next one or two years. They have that okay. ability to do that. So don't assume it's going to be dilutive. Okay. So I got two quick questions to wrap it up, Scott. Real quick. So I mean, if you could just go, go real quick. Number one. Um, has the acquisition um, environment gotten more favorable from a, from a, from a acquisition price perspective? So over the, over the last few months, they have hired multiple people in the M&A department and they've hired an outside firm to help them. Mm -hmm. And so they are, the infrastructure is there to look at more deals. And secondly, since the convert um, done by Silicon Valley Bank, they are on the radar of all of the bankers and all of the companies. And given the markets imploded, 
And so many spec pharma companies that are um, laden with debt, they can't keep up with the number of opportunities that are in front of them. Okay, excellent. And lastly, um, is there any other upside, surprise upside that we could see here that could help the company? I mean, I know, I know there was the the the, the issue of the, the lawsuit we talk about, right? Maybe you want to give a quick, you know, sure. You think what that's so, going on there, and, and what, what the upside could be there? What, what investors are missing there? What, what they're what they're mispricing there? Sure. There so there's two things that I want to say. One is the the old Depomed had opioid exposure, so that's the other risk, Maj, aside from a generic on Indocent. So the opioid cases are moving through the courts. Um, they've been dismissed from about, I don't know, 100, 150 cases with no recourse. And there are about 200 cases left. And the expectation is they're going to be dismissed from those with no recourse. And uh, it's too long to get into in this conversation, but um, that is something to be aware of. And it's probably uh, a negative on the multiple, but there's a court ruling coming in January that could release them from the bulk of these cases. And that obviously could be a catalyst. The second thing I want to say is on Indocin, there was an issue earlier in this year with Medicaid sales under a program called Medicaid 340B, where hospitals can buy the product for a penny. And meanwhile, Indocin still has to pay their distributors, their wholesalers full price, and then it's sold to the hospital for a penny. So in Assertio pulled themselves from the Medicaid program effective October 1. And in doing so, they forced the hospitals to either not use the product or to pay full price for the product in a commercial, uh, a commercial price. And to prevent inventory bloating, they cut their inventories from 20 days, which is a normal level, to zero. So the fourth quarter numbers could be quite huge and it could be a catalyst when they report in uh, the February, March timeframe because the hospitals that were illegally ordering under the 340B program will have to now order um, paying a commercial price. And so that could be a big boon. And then number two, they are rebuilding the inventory in the channel back from zero days back to 20 days. So that I'm expecting to drive a huge Q4 number. So I'm not sure why the stock has lifted here recently, um, but I think that there is a series of events that could catalyze the stock back to highs, $4 or so, one of them being the fourth quarter, two is another acquisition, and then three is um, starting the trials to get the patent on Indocin, the exclusivity on Indocin, and as more and more people understand the transformation to this becoming more of a durable asset, the valuation should expand immediately. And, actually, and four, you know, dismissal of more lawsuits could be an, an, another interesting. Yeah, yeah, thing. yeah that yeah, too. Yeah. 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 Right, so, well, thanks so much, Scott, for being here with Scott Weiss, uh, um, pitching uh, Asertio, ASRT. We both own some shares in the stock. It's, it, I think it's Scott's biggest position. Um, so thanks a lot, Scott, man. And um, what's, uh, what's rooting for you here and for the team? Thanks a lot. <laughs> thanks, man. Bye. All right, there, there we have it. That was Team USA. Maj, thank you again for moderating this. Where can our audience go and find more information on you as well as Geo Investing? Yeah, so you can find more about the Geo go by going to geoinvesting.com and we have um, you know a, a seven day free trial going on right now. To learn more about what we do, we we um, we interview management teams um, on, on an obsessive basis. Uh, we uh, have a morning email that goes out every morning to our members. We have a weekly wrap up email. Long reports, short reports, anything you would want really to get your get get your really um, research grind going. We follow what we call tier one companies, which means which which meet or are moving to meet a ten point criteria list of, of things we're looking at. So, um, so uh, you can follow me, Maj Geo Investing on Twitter. You can follow Geo Investing at Geo Investing on Twitter also, um, and send us um, you can send me an email directly at Maj at geoinvesting.com or support at geoinvesting.com. Very good. Maj, thank you again, man. This was great. Thanks, Bobby. Thank you.